This evening's talk is uh, it's titled The Culture of Cutting, which is a frank discussion and uh, awareness raising talk on the scourge of female genita genital mutilation, or FGM. Uh, it's been 25 years since the Union passed its Declaration uh, of Human Rights for Children. Um, and in this year, it's estimated that one in five sub Saharan, sub -Saharan African girls um, are affected on a yearly basis from FGM. If you expand that and extrapolate it, that's approximately 140 million, million women around the world have at some time been affected either socially, physically, or psychosexually by FGM. Um, and this isn't something that is concerned or located only around uh, developing nations or, or the East, for want of a better phrase. Uh, it's estimated by the Home Office that there are around 6,500 women in the UK alone who are on a yearly basis uh, exposed to the risk of FGM. Uh, and then, again, needless to say, both in the United States, Canada, and lots of Europe as well. Uh, to talk about these matters in more depth uh, and to raise issues, uh, we do have two speakers. I'll introduce one who's present now, um, is Laura McDonald. Laura studied social anthropologies with sub-honours in sub-Africa, uh, sub, uh, sub sub-honour in Arabic and Middle Eastern studies at St Andrews. She's completed a PhD at the Centre for Women's Studies at the University of York in Gender, Intersectionality and Islam. Uh, she's then contributed to a seven-year research programme at the University of Birmingham on community state engagement and conflict, with a focus on the impact of terrorism and counter-terrorism on Muslim communities. She's combined academic and activist interests in justice, security and social relations as a founder and co-director of Connect Justice, she lectures internationally while researching, engaging, and advising high-impact projects for several organizations. Please welcome Laura. Thank you so much. Salaam alaikum and good evening. Um, it's always really fun to be at City Circle because you have a space here which I think is important to discuss these kind of issues and create debate. And um, I, I have to apologize as well that I had planned this to be uh, this sort of second person, the person to pull out the questions and frame things. So um, with that in mind, I just wanted to perhaps draw on exactly what's already been said, that what we're talking about tonight and what Rakea um, Shalom and Chikamis is talking about is such a, um, a brutal... Um, a brutal act and something that affects people, you know, on, in the most intimate way, but also then has the ways within our community. So it's not just individual women and girls who are at the focus of this, but it's our families, it's marriages, it's communities, and it's the way even perhaps we perceive um, gender relations. It, it, it feeds into all of those things. So while I'm going to be talking about theory and fic and um, kind of framing the issues. What I wanted to say was that we have to bear in mind that we can talk about theory, we can talk about culture and, and, and theology, but always with mind to the fact that this is a reality for people right here you know, in our communities. These are our, these are our sisters in humanity, they're our sisters in our communities that this is happening to. Um, and, and, and so when we abstract and we take a step back and we start thinking about the underlying discourses, we have to think of the reality. So that's how I wanted to sort of start off, that, that, that it's easy to take a distance. Which brings me to our, my second point, which was more of an observation, and I hope that this will facilitate our discussion, is that um, as a British Muslim from a, a cultural background where this isn't practiced routinely, um, and I think I speak for, for, for some but not others, it's very easy to distance this. So there's often this thing, oh, well, you know, uh, FGM is a terrible thing, um, but, you know, it's, it's culture, and Muslims do it, yeah, but so do non-Muslims, and, and it happens far away. So we almost make these statements, yes, this is terrible what's happening, but um, it's happening elsewhere, or it's not really to do with us. We, we create a distance. And from that distance, there's a sense sometimes that well, we're not really doing anything. We're not speaking out about it, and we're certainly not active on the issue. So although it's true that there are many different faith backgrounds that practice this, and that it is culturally located, um, I would also say that that's not the whole picture. Um, 
And similarly, we can also say, well, you know, it's quite obvious in the UK, uh, um, it is an illegal practice. And as citizens of the UK, Muslim and non-Muslim, it's an illegal practice, we respect the law, and therefore the law in itself provides guidance against this practice. Or it's about shifting culture, and we should talk about health awareness and those kind of things, which is also true. But again, it doesn't necessarily get to the crux of the matter, which is where we understand cultural practices. And because this is City Circle and because you provide this space to talk about the difficult questions, I wanted to talk about from the Muslim perspective, because often we, we shy away from this and people say, well, it's nothing to do with Islam. <coughs> and in many cases it isn't, and it's, uh, and it's important that we don't conflate things. But culture is often underpinned by the power of religious discourse. It's often um, justified through the power of what we see as, as normative or permissible or supported tacitly or explicitly. So I just wanted to address that head on because I think it's something that sometimes we shy away from and it's something that we shouldn't be because it's an important question more broadly about how we navigate these issues within our religious framework. So when we talk about um, the actual problem there are practices going on, and, and I was hoping, you know, okay, would go over. There are different forms of female genital mutilation, and there's even sensitivities about what we call this. Um, so, female genital mutilation or female genital cutting, um, and, and a kind of that use of the word cutting is somehow neutralising what's going on, and also different type of types and, and different levels of cutting. But the underlying point, and I, I understand this is what okay would have been getting to is that any form of this cutting has an impact on the girls and women that, that, that this is done to. Um, and therefore, when I start talking about the discourse within the religious thing, I think we have to be careful about, you know, when we talk about moderation, when we talk about levels. So that's just a kind of um, heads up there. Because um, there are various rulings within the FIC um, of varying shades relating to the permissibility or in fact impermissibility of this. And the first thing that's interesting when we look um, at what uh, our scholastic heritage has said about this, we see that there's a lot of things about the discourse of harm. So people will say, well, it's a cultural practice, um, but if it's done, um, then it should be done with moderation and it should be about um, the discourse of harm. If, if, it's, if, if it's done without harm, then it's okay, it's permissible. So there's that kind of uh, discourse of harm. And then there's the discourse of moderation, the idea that it is even recommended, and in some rulings, that it is even a sunnah. And now, just to flag up there, the Prophet himself, peace be upon him, did not practice this, and he did not do it to his daughter um, or daughters, but he, um, uh, still within the kind of scholastic discourse, people refer to this practice as a sunnah in some cases. And again, we have to look about what people are talking about, but it's a discourse of moderation. So people say, well, it's about cutting lightly, and that's permissible, it's even recommended. So, so there's, the, there are various nuances. And then there's even those, um, particularly within the Shafi school, although it isn't, um, there isn't consensus even within that matter, that it is wajib. So although we, we, uh, we sometimes shy away from these issues, we have to address the fact that within our scholastic tradition there are a range of views, and they do focus around this notion of moderation, and they do focus around this discourse of harm and, 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 and doing things you know, within, within a boundary. But the fact is that there are, there, are, there are justifications or ways to support particular practices. And now these views are not based on Qur'an, but they are based on a hadith. And there are quite a lot of um, hadith that we can find where it's at least recognised as a practice and in some cases um, explained. Um, I'm aware of the time, so I don't want to go into too many details of the actual hadith. Do you want me to? Okay. Well, I may as well. I'll, I'll see how, how, how people are, are feeling. But, for example, there are um, ones that talk about fitra. So um, Abu Huraira um, narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu um, said that there are five practices that are characteristics of the fitra. Circumcision, shaving the pubic region, clipping the nails, and cutting the moustaches short. Now, many of us might read that while we're talking about men there, um, quite clearly about men. But because
because, um, and as I say, I'm a sociologist, but I, I, I engage with the theology, um, <coughs> the, the gender neutrality of the particular way that circumcision is, is phrased within that hadith means that then it is applied to men and women. So even someone as, a, a, you know, Imam Nawawi, for example, um, talks about that particular issue, and therefore that, that it refers to both men and women. And the, the notion of fitra is an interesting one within that. Um, and then we've got lots of hadith, or not lots, but some hadith, where um, it's a passing reference as a norm. So, for example, Aisha talking about when the two circumcised parts meet, then the back is obligatory. So talking about um, sexual intercourse and, and, and referring to both the male and the female parts as being circumcised. So again, not specifically, specifically um, uh, uh, focusing on the actual act or that it should or shouldn't be done, but almost in passing as a normative practice. And again, that's something that people have then uh, embedded, embedded certain notions about. And then, um, uh, and as uh, yeah, yeah, as well, um, from Malik. And, and some of these are, are clusters so here. And then, of course, um, uh, those indeed that talk about um, not uh, the most famous one, perhaps, where the Prophet was said to uh, um, say to Umatiya, "Do not cut severely, as that is better for a woman and more desirable for her husband." So again, the discourse of moderation that's narrated by Daoud. So, there are a whole range of hadith uh, which, to varying extents, are seen as somehow um, allowing or making it permissible within that boundary of moderation. And that's what I think is an interesting point, and I can't wait for Rukeya to, 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 to talk more, more briefly. I, just said, I was just saying that um, I, I'm just interested in bringing out some of the subtleties in, in, in order. The question of the perplexities that people put on this issue, mm -hmm. as opposed to actually the reality of how we So this, so, so this whole focus on moderation, uh, which but ultimately I would say supports the practice. So for example, um, it's often quite shocking for people to realise that in Malaysia and Indonesia um, forms what, what the uh, World Health Organisation talks about, type 1 and type 4. So technically light cuttings, piercings, small removals of um, uh, the, the literal hood, those kind of things are practiced as normative uh, Islam. That's something that even happens in hospitals. So in the same way as in the UK, often boys get circumcised um, in those areas which are um, promoting chaffe, but a certain kind of chaffe, but, you know, the little girls are often born, you know, babies are born in hospital and this is done by midwives, for example. So there's also almost a medicalization in that it is a normal practice and it's not seen as a problem. It's seen as just, you know, oh, this is light, this is moderated, and, and this is, there's no question about it. But what's interesting about that whole uh, discourse is that what perhaps, and this is what I want to open out, by saying that there are different levels and oh, we can do things by moderation, these things are always subjective, and that's what, what I'm interested in. If we say do things in moderation, if we cut lightly, what, what, what does that mean to particular practitioners? What does that mean in a particular cultural or social or familial context? What one person may see as light, what, what, does, what does that mean for another? So what I'm, I'm interested in is, are we actually opening the door to all sorts of forms of practices by somehow legitimizing this concept of moderation? And I think that's a really interesting thing. And similarly, when we're talking about it from the Muslim perspective, if we have particularly, a particular scholastic um, uh, perspectives, rulings, um, opinions, by challenging the practice, are we somehow betraying our scholastic heritage? Are we, you know, I was trained, uh, I was taught a lot of Shafi Fit. By questioning this practice, does that mean that I'm somehow insulting the, the, you know, the heritage of Imam Shafi? And how do we navigate that? So I think that's an important question for Muslims, uh, and actually uh, about where we take responsibility and what's going on here. Uh, and I'm aware, uh, I want to okay, yeah, this, 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 this is the person we really need to listen to. But when we're talking about what the underlying reasons for that, so we can say, okay, so some scholars say that it's permissible with the moderation. But what's interesting is what we then justify, you know, the reasons that we say uh, we do these practices. And again, we come back to the cultural uh, side.
assumptions and understandings, which are highly problematic as well. So as well as a uh, male circumcision is also for some a controversial subject, but I don't want to get onto that. But, but, but when we talk about male circumcision, it tends to be, you know, this is the way that the prophets did things, you know, tracing it back to the, to the you know, to, uh, to, to all of the prophets, peace be upon them, and that it's about health and all sorts of things. For women, when we're talking about this particular issue, it gets, um, uh, it gets attached to things about honour, about family honour, about moderating women's sexual desires. And there's a lot of discourse about, you know, if we, if we make these cuts, um, you know, our girls won't be wild, there'll be less promiscuity, um, the, the fitna inherent in women's sexuality will be moderated. Um, so there's some very problematic uh, kind of underlying assumptions about gender, about women's uh, and men's relationship to each other, if you like. There are, there are concepts of cleanliness, which I would say, you know, from a contemporary perspective, we could, we could question, you know, from a medical perspective. And, and, and even ideas about the sexual attractiveness for a husband of, of, of a woman's um, parts. And again, again, it's highly problematic. I'm sure I don't need to, to go into that. So what I'm saying is that there's the, there's the thick elements and there's, this, there's various discourses of moderation and of, of, of harm and less harm. And then there's these underlying kind of gendered assumptions, cultural assumptions about the nature of men and women, the nature of women's bodies, of sexuality, cleanliness, and these kind of things. Um, so, so I just wanted to highlight those and, and how, how, how does that affect what we're doing. And going back to this notion of navigating the scholastic tradition, um, there still do remain plenty, there's, there's a lot of room for um, dissent, I guess. So, first of all, the hadith that are used to support where they are used to support these, um, these practices. Um, many of the great scholars actually question the classification. So, people will then say, well, actually, they're, of, they're weak hadith. Um, and that includes Abu Dawood and, and al Bayha. So, I mean, really, really important to keep this scholars there. And secondly, and what's interesting, particularly about the contemporary scholastic views, are going back to this discourse of harm, because it's very clear from the Islamic perspective on all, all kind of um, uh, issues that, that where things harm, we, we can stay away from them. Uh, and therefore, we know, and I'm sure Rafa is going to be very clear about the situation, that physical damage, the emotional damage, the, the, the social damage um, uh, that occurs to girls, women, families, and, uh, and everyone else connected to that, us as society, the fabric of society, if this is harmful in all of those ways, um, then, then, then the ambiguity is really uh, being finished. If it's harmful, then we leave it. So when we, when we start worrying about, you know, saying something's haram, when it's or even something say to it's haram when people say it's sunnah, perhaps we need to, to set away, nobody necessarily even has to say it's haram. There's precedent within, so many precedents within our um, traditions about saying, well look, stop doing this because it's not working. We're not saying it's haram, but we're saying that it's damaging and therefore it should be left alone. So even for those who feel uncomfortable about, about that perspective, it, it becomes quite clear, I would argue quite clear about um, what we deal with, what we do with it. And going back to the Makassar of the Sharia, uh, and you know, what is the point of the Sharia, the underlying uh, issues of justice, of promoting health and well-being of individuals and, and communities. Um, so I just wanted to leave you, um, I suppose, by saying uh, we, we do have current scholars, I mean, that we, we follow different ones, but there's whole concepts around um, aura, you know, the practice of it agency of a woman or a young girl uh, and what's being done to her. Um, people such as um, the uh, Dr. Ali Goma uh, of al Azhar University who's given his opinion, his fatwa, uh, and he focuses again on the harm, discourse of harm, and that harm should be, uh, should be um, the one main reason for leaving this, um, you know, well than condemning it and, 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 and preventing it. Um, he talks about the tendency towards excess within human nature, and I think that's a, an important thing. When we talk about moderation, you know, we do tend to go in an excessive way. He also points to the inauthenticity of, of, of the Hadith that used to 
um, justify it. Um, Yusuf al Khaladawi, who is a very powerful figure in many of our communities, um, and who took a very, I would say, an apologetic stance at one point on this issue, has become um, far more clear about it. And again, he talks about um, it not being haram, but uh, it should be necessarily banned on the grounds again of harm. Um, and similarly, we've got people like uh, Mohammed Said uh, Ramadan Abuti of Syria, um, who talks about being no um, uh, precedence from the Prophet's own practice, from the actual Sunnah, peace be upon him, and that it is in fact a violation in the harm. So, in light of those kind of um, uh, opinions and the complexities and, and the, the problematic discourse that perhaps we're now struggling with in contemporary times when we can see what's happening. And, and that perhaps the, the, the rulings become complex and difficult to navigate, I, I would put it to us to, when we're discussing these things that we can be confident from a Muslim perspective that these things are quite clear, that the practices uh, are, are, are condemnable and we don't have to somehow be betraying our, our religious or communal um, situation in order to say that. Um, and I'll stop talking because uh, I hope I've just brought out some of the issues um, that you can really Give us, give us the reality of it. Um, good evening, everybody. I'd better start by making my profuse, profound apologies. Um, I've had like the worst journey, <laughs> but um, the fact that I'm here now. Um, just to tell you a little bit but about myself, I'm Mikhail Sarami, I'm the head of Campaign in the Advocacy at um, the UK's leading um, charity Forward um, that works to kind of end the practice of FGM. So I think Laura's kind of framed um, FGM within the Islam tradition and, and, and brought out the arguments and the scripture as to why um, it is a condemnable practice. And I think I'll go from the social perspective, give you a little bit of a history of female genital mutilation, um, and then talk about where we're at at the moment. So I think the first thing to kind of say is that FGM as a practice precedes Islam. It's supposed to have started in Pharaonic Egypt um, uh, around well, many thousands of years ago, about 3,000 years ago, and it was thought that the sewing was done for preservation of women's um, cleanliness, but in addition to that also about making sure that she is her husband. In a sense. So I think it's important that we frame the practice of FGM outside of the context of Islam. And then um, when we look at the kind of practice culturally, we can see that in many places, even though it might be practiced by Muslims, it's actually cultural as opposed to religion. So the next thing is to kind of identify the fact that, for example, in a place like, uh, excuse me, FGM is practiced in 28 African and Middle Eastern countries. Um, with prevalence kind of ranging from 98% in Somalia, 96% around in Egypt, um, and about 88% in Sierra Leone, for example. Um, but then you have pockets of high prevalence in other areas, so even though you have prevalence of FGM in some of like Tanzania at about 36%, in particular regions of Tanzania, it could be higher. So, as I said, in some places, and I think um, Laura has identified there are four types of FGM. So type 1, which is kind of a kind of little snip, as they call it. Type 2, which is kind of the removal of the control hip. Type 3, which is the most physically severe form of FGM, which is actually the sewing of the um, labia, so the sewing of the vaginal lips. Um, the removal of the clitoris and then a tiny hole that's left for women to be able um, to urinate and menstruate, etc. So what we're dealing here with is not really um, a question of is it harmful or is it not. We see through the practice of type 3 FGM, which is practiced quite severely in areas such as Somalia, um, such as um, Ethiopia, um, such certain regions in Tanzania, for example, that this can be a particularly harmful practice. FGM can result in infertility, um, death on doing it, constant lifetime of actual pain, urinary tract infections, problems on giving birth, 
um, death of the child because of complications during birthing. And so you see that the actual harm of FGM can be particularly grave. In addition to the physical impact of FGM, of course, we must actually think about the trauma and mental health impacts of women that go through this. Um, you have women who live lifelong suffering, lifelong flashbacks, the question of um, who care, you know, because sometimes these girls who are cut are presented in family situations where it's quite loving, you know, it's just regular family prior to that and then they go through this incident and it's just like a one-off and then post that things return to normal. So that kind of the mental health impacts of something like that happening. And then in addition to that, you live in, in many countries where FGM, for example, or program work in Tanzania, acts as a precursor for marriage. So girls can be cut around 11 or 12, and then once they're cut, it's the idea that you're ready now to become a bride, and then obviously they go forth um, to become a bride. So the social impacts of FGM, the physical impacts of FGM, as well as the psychological impacts of FGM, point to the fact that it's not, um, it is a harmful practice, it's not a practice that doesn't leave damage on girls. Oft times you'll hear the idea that all oh, type 1 is just a snip. Um, and so we have to kind of go beyond the question of what are the physical impacts of FGM and that's actually look at what are the surrounding issues affecting FGM. And also situated within a space of bodily integrity. I think it's really important what you said about harm, you know, and I think I was actually at the Department for um, International Development recently with um, some Jewish, Muslim and Christian leaders discussing how what we can do to end FGM. And um, you know, representatives there were saying the point of the matter is that in Islam, if it is harmful, then it isn't permissible in that sense, and that FGM must be situated within that. And I think it's important to do so. As I pointed out, in some places, FGM is absolutely nothing to do with religion. Um, Sierra Leone, which has a high prevalence of FGM, above 80%, FGM is actually related very much more to secret society practice. Um, women in certain regions of Sierra Leone felt that you know they created this secret society which is known as Bondo. And the Bondo culture, in order to kind of be admitted into Bondo culture, you have to go through FGM. So you don't get access to Bondo kind of society unless you've been cut. Um, the same also is kind of linked in areas like Liberia, where also FGM is not really about religion at all. Again, it's about access to secret society engagement. And so you really actually begin to understand that in order to kind of tackle FGM, you also have to kind of come away from just looking at it from a religious perspective. You have to kind of understand that this is kind of intrinsic to like the cultural practices of certain communities. So FGM in Sierra Leone or Tanzania, for example, whereas in Somalia you might have girls who are cut upon birth, it's, it's a rite of passage, you know, you get to 13 or 14 and you present yourself to be cut, you know, it's a party, it's an exciting happening, it's a big thing, kind of like entering into womanhood. And so these girls are also kind of having to deal with the trauma of having to present themselves to be cut and obviously have access to Bondo society. To kind of bring it home a bit um, to the British context, um, forward kind of our research from 2007 indicated that up to 100,000 girls every year are at risk of FGM in the UK, um, or women and girls are affected by FGM in the UK. 24,000 of those girls are under the age of 15 and at risk of type 3 FGM, which is the most physically severe form of FGM in the UK. FGM has been illegal in the UK now for about 30 years. We've had legislation making FGM illegal. And I kind of want to kind of bring to your attention the reason FGM was made illegal in the first place and the fact that part of it was to do with like, um, the medical and health inequity that happened with women who were presenting. So, obviously you had, in, at this time 30 years ago, women presenting to maternal or gynecological services who basically looked different, you know, because their genitalia did not resemble regular genitalia as it was assumed. 
And what was happening to these women is that these doctors had no idea about FGM, no idea about what to do with women who are presented who've been through FGM, no idea how to deinfibulate. So if you had a woman who's had type 3 FGM, in order for her to give birth, she'd need to be uncut. And these doctors were not aware of how to do this. So you had women going through childbirth who were, in essence, near death because of the bleeding, the excessive trauma of it, and the doctors not knowing with it. Um, for an example, I had a situation where a doctor was actually um, a woman that was recounting a case in the 80s of a woman presenting from FGM, and she, the doctors actually asked her you know, how she'd been attacked down there by an animal type thing. So you see that there was absolutely no awareness about FGM, and that's actually causing deaths or real damage to women's health. And so Forward, um, which was set up by a midwife, um, came and said, look, we need to campaign about this. These women deserve services and they deserve access to fair health care. You need to do something to make this illegal. Girls are being cut and this is not acceptable. So we had the first Female Circumcision Act in um, 1985 in the UK. Following which, um, not really much activity on female genital mutilation it wasn't really taken seriously in this country with regards to policy makers and that level of engagement. To campaign in organisations such as Ford continued campaigning and there was kind of like the momentum building. 2003 we got the FGM Act which actually made it illegal for you to take your child if it's a British citizen or a, a permanent national abroad to be cut and undergo FGM. So then in 2003, you had this massive break that said, okay, look, this is a serious issue. This is a child protection issue. This is, a child, this is also a form of violence against women and girls, and it must be framed as such. Following that, 2003, 10 years later, the legislation has been leaving for 30 years. We've not had one single arrest, FGM-related arrest, um, for girls who've been cut. In Europe, they say about 500,000 girls are affected by FGM annually. But equally, com comparatively to the UK, France had a spate of kind of like arrests related to FGM um, and criminalisation of the act, which, if you look at thought of some people, could be considered um, successful. How kind of forward works to think FGM should be ended is that FGM, as I said, is actually a long held social norm. We're talking thousands of years. And so we say that really the only way to effectively challenge FGM is through actual social engagement. Really working with communities that practice FGM and getting to the heart and root of why they practice FGM, what the thoughts and understanding of the benefits of FGM is. We avoid the kind of concept that FGM is a barbaric practice. We don't really think barbarism is a useful term in relation to FGM. Communities aren't going to respond to that. So you have to kind of empower and enable communities, and I think Laura kind of indicated some of the ways that this is possible, <clears throat> to actually say this is a practice we don't need to carry on. So we've been looking at a form of ways to do this. In our countries and where we're working in abroad, we kind of frame this through um, an alternative rites of passage kind of process in Sierra Leone. So you, we say women can become, girls can become women, girls can have access into society, we know this is an important part for you, without actually going through the process of being cut. And ensuring that that's something that can kind of be taken on by communities, transformed and enabled. So you do that as a person. Stop this barbaric practice, it's evil, because parents aren't doing or cutting their girls because they want to be evil their daughters. They genuinely believe that this is in their children's best interest. In the UK, we use a women's power, empowerment and leadership strategy. So we say, use a human rights brace and say the integrity of the children is paramount. And we talk around FGM, so we talk about a whole load of issues that are about child protection, about the integrity of the body, um, about values and human rights. And then go through to that to the middle of this, why are you practicing SUNA or FGM, which sort of is how many communities understand or coin FGM at the moment. Um, and then, you know, through that, you actually see some response. So, for example, in 2007 in Bristol, through that engagement, we had the first FGM.
again, March of Somali women saying that we don't want our daughters cut. So you see that FGM can only effectively be challenged and ended when communities are at the heart of the process. Um, and I think it's important to note that because even though we have a you know, rising kind of discussion about FGM, and as I think hopefully it's been made clear, FGM is a harmful practice, what's happening is that nationally there's a push to prosecute people. You know, there's not been an arrest, there's 30 years of legislation, we need somebody to be arrested, these people are barbaric, lock them up to stop the practice. Um, and I think it's important that we, as those kind of championing um, the kind of end of FGM, have avoided that language because we know that this is a rights-based issue. Violence against women and girls for another form of violence that could be looked at as social issue, such as domestic violence. You know, we went through a process of that being illegal, but then kind of through actual social engagement and making it a practice that is not just permissible. You know, at one point, police would come to a woman who presented and had been hit by her spouse and say, well, this is domestic issue, it's nothing to do with us. You know, we feel FGM has to go through the same process. Increasingly, what we're finding quite worryingly is that FGM is being framed within this space of, of, of barbarism, which is not helpful, and is kind of being used to um, pinpoint an other. So it's, it's practiced by these dangerous other communities who, in addition to doing FGM, also have gangs and do terrorism and, and sell drugs. And so that's kind of like FGM is what the women do. So we feel it's essential to kind of remove it from that frame as well. So I think kind of like the message is I'd say is that harmful. FGM is a form of harm. It's a harmful practice. FGM is um, necessary. It has no kind of health benefits at all. FGM in many sections is done for kind of social acceptance, but also does um, continue to be practiced in the ideas of maintaining a woman's chastity or maintaining a woman's womanhood or making sure that she's safe and good for her husband or her spouse. Um, and FGM is something that ties communities together or has tied communities together in a sense. And so we feel to kind of end FGM, you have to get to the heart of understanding why people continue this practice. What is the understood benefits of the continuance of FGM? And how do you demonstrate that you actual cultural ideals can be maintained without FGM being a part of that. We are very weary as forward, and me as an individual really, of the constant rise for prosecutions and just snatching up parents for removing children from their family homes and telling them their parents are evil. So we're not really about that and we say a community centred approach in which children and child rights is at the heart of it is the way to kind of end FGM. I think I'll stop.